because we are hunger and compassion for truth. This verse was what God used to show me as a struggle. I, was, I got saved my senior year in high school, but when I came to Georgia and first time in my life I got my faith challenged at UGA <coughs> among some of the professors, it made me really question whether or not there was intellectual integrity to the Christian faith. I knew what I believed, but I didn't know why I believed it. I could not have defended the Bible. And so I began to read Josh McDowell, um, More Than a Carpenter, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And this issue particularly was what God used in my life to convince me the Bible was the Word of God and Jesus was the Son of God. Because when I saw that this was written, and this is, there's no disputing that this was 700 B.C. No disputing. No, no scholar will ever dispute have you covered how you know the dating of books and stuff, or not yet? We've not talked about. So basically, it's the kind of parchment it would be have been written on, the style of Hebrew, the even the the uh, the clay jars that they would preserve them in. All of that makes dating books like Isaiah very easily. Uh, so there's no dispute among any that this was 700 B.C. And so I looked at that and I said, I just saw. There is no way you could have scriptures, and this is just one, there's 300 uh, prophecies about Jesus, but there's no way that could be written without a divine author and without Jesus being who he claimed to be. There's a, there's, it's impossible that this could have been written that much ahead of time, and it's so specifically speaking of Jesus, and the death by crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet, when this was written, so pierced all that all that language, there was not even crucifixion at that time, and so it, it just had such an impact on me because I went this. I literally remember as about a sophomore in college, I think I was living in Creswell dorm, almost trembling, thinking this book that I hold, the Bible, had had to have had a divine author. It had to have been inspired by the Holy Spirit. And somebody once said, if you're a guy, you wanted to prove your existence. One of the great ways you do that is predict something well in advance of it happening and have it happen just like you predicted. <laughs> so it showed me not only that the Bible was an inspired document, but that Jesus was who he claimed to be because he and he alone fulfilled these prophecies. So I hope these type of evidences, if you're in this room and you're a skeptic or you're, un, you're unconvinced, we're so glad you're here. Uh, but if you truly investigate, honest with an honest heart, God will have you run headlong into his son because that's he created you to know his son. That's why you're here on it. And if you are a believer, our desire and prayer is that this would just solidify your faith, that you would be unmoved, unswayed, even when difficulty comes. Circumstances come that are hard. And, we're, and that's going to happen. We're all going to get dealt things that may really cause us to question God. That's normal. But when you have these convictions, especially about the Bible, especially about the identity of Jesus, then you can stand firm in your faith even when things happen that you may struggle with. Thank you for that. Yeah, I just love that as an anchor point. You know, you think of, like Pastor Ray was saying, we all get, we, we face trials, we, we doubt, we pray the prayer, Lord, we believe, help us uh, with our unbelief, right? So what are some places in Scripture you can go back to to kind of re-anchor and re-establish your faith? I, I love, this is one of the ones I use personally, just because it's so it's so obvious and it's so powerful. It's, right, it's about the bullseye of the gospel, which is the person, the work, um, the crucifixion, the atonement, and of course the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so back to the, uh, the concept of uh, probabilities, um, or sorry, the, ju just just the power of these fulfilled prophecies in being a convincing reason to trust the Bible. So we talked about several hundred prophecies. We mentioned 48 direct prophecies of the Messiah. And so with this analysis, we're just considering eight, okay? Eight prophecies about the Messiah, the type of life he would live, his death, and then his resurrection from the dead. And there was a mathematician named Peter Stoner who calculated um, the chances of one person fulfilling just eight specific prophecies of those prophecies about Jesus throughout their life are one in 10 to the 17th power. I'm not a mathematician. I know that's a really big number, 
you know, one zero 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 zero. You have a much better odds of winning Powerball than you have of uh, that happening. And that's just A to the prophecies. And since most of us do not have like an intuitive feel for a number that large, some of you have heard this before, here is the kind of thought experiment that Stoner gave. Has anybody ever been to Texas before? Been visited the state, the, the Lone Star State? You ever driven from like Galveston all the way across like to El Paso? It's like 860 miles on I-10. <laughs> yeah. You're just in Texas. Just Texas and Texas and, te and more Texas. And you think you're done with Texas, there's some more Texas to go through. You know, I drive from here to West Virginia to visit my family pretty frequently. I think it's 550 miles. And I go, let's see, uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and then West Virginia just to get there. And I'm almost in Pennsylvania by the time I get home. Well, Texas is like, obviously a very huge state. So imagine the state of Texas, he says, um, and it's covered with silver dollars and I think three feet high, okay? That would, is it two feet, only two, two feet. feet. Okay, well, feet. it's bound to happen then. <laughs> so two feet high. Uh, that's, that's a lot of silver dollars, right? Imagine this room covered with silver dollars two feet high. If you had that kind of money, you'd be rich. Well, needless to say, how many of this room could fit into Texas? Um, one silver dollar is marked. Let's say we're gonna paint red and we're gonna put it in with the rest somewhere. Nobody knows where. Okay, we're gonna have a guy parachute out of an airplane and just land somewhere in Texas blindfolded and um, just kind of sat, uh, you know, scour around and pick up one silver dollar, okay? He has about a one in 10 to the 17th chance of getting the right silver dollar, okay? That's the odds of someone just by chance fulfilling um, just eight, just eight of those messianic prophecies about Jesus, okay? So uh, this did not happen by chance. <laughs> this was God's will, it was prophesied, it was predicted, and it perfectly came together in the person and the work of Jesus of Nazareth. All right, the, the Bible is predetermined. This is the issue of the canon, not the thing downtown, but the two weird looking things. You know, by the way, like why they actually, this thing actually never saw any combat. This was only a prototype. And the problem with the double barrel cannon, why it's such a relic, they could never get it to fire at the same time. Because in order for the recoil not to throw off the trajectory, it's got to be like timed down to like the microsecond. And the technology of the day wouldn't permit that. So that's why you find it in downtown Athens uh, as a relic of history. But we're not talking about that sort of canon. In this sense, the word canon is referring to the authoritative list of the books of the Bible. So there are 66 books in the Bible, which is the true Bible, the Protestant Bible. Sorry, any Catholics out there, we can talk about that later. Um, but 39 books in the Hebrew Bible, also known as the Tanakh, right? The Hebrew Bible, and 27 books in the New Testament. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Apocrypha in a second, not a whole lot. Um, so the question comes up, of course, why these 66 books? Why are there 66? Why aren't there 65? Why aren't there 57? Why aren't there 79? Why <laughs> these 66, right? Aren't they just kind of arbitrary? And this is where people will say, Oh, well, don't you know it was uh, Emperor Constantine in the fourth century that cherry picked which books he wanted in the Bible and which ones should be left out? Absolute baloney. Constantine did not care. All he cared is that people were believing the same thing. He didn't want discord, he didn't have a pony in the fight. And by the way, Nicaea, I'm kind of jumping the gun here. Let's go ahead and move down. But we should read 2 Peter 1, verse 3 real quick because that's in your notes. Um, what God has given us in the canonized book, Peter tells us, his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So this is what is contained in the Bible. Does it have all knowledge? No, it's not going to tell you how to change the oil in your pickup truck, okay? You have to consult your owner's manual for that. It's not going to teach you calculus. It doesn't purport to. 
Um, it's not going to teach you psychopharmacology. I just spent a lot of time studying that stuff, right? Um, molecular pharmacology was not an easy class. If you want to learn that stuff, you've got to go study, right, through other methods. It gives you everything you need to know about life and godliness, the Christian life, who God is, who we are spiritually, why we were created, what the problem is, how to be restored to God, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Okay, so some common questions or challenges by skeptics, uh, the Constantine one I mentioned, didn't, uh, and here, they'll usually throw out um, the term Council of Nicaea, right? Have y'all heard that one before? <laughs> because it sounds like they've studied it. But here's the interesting thing about that. If they say something about the canon and the Council of Nicaea, one thing you know for sure right away is what? They've never studied this. <laughs> they've never, ever, ever looked into it, or they just completely forgot whatever they read because the Council of Nicaea was a real thing. It happened in 325 AD. The issue of the Bible canon did not come up at all in any way, shape, or form at the Council of Nicaea. That was later. That was the Council, Council of Carthage, I believe, in 397 AD. Um, so no, the person says that, right away you know they don't, they don't know what they're talking about. They're trying to sound smart. They're trying to shoot holes in your belief in the Bible but it's something they themselves have not even bothered to study. Okay. Um, we'll look at that, the Apocrypha and the Gnostic Gospels. So as I mentioned, 325 AD, um, what happened? What actually happened at the Council of Nicaea? This is right after Christianity is legalized in the Roman Empire. Constantine supposedly uh, converts to Christianity. I know that's somewhat debatable. It's not really our topic here tonight. But, you know, he gets all the bishops and stuff together. People who were had body parts missing, they had arms cut off and stuff like that because Christians were so persecuted. Now, all of a sudden, they're invited into the royal courts there in Rome. <laughs> that must have been kind of weird, right? It's legal. The emperor claims to be a Christian. So let's make sure everybody's believing the same thing. So the Council of Nicaea took up something known as the area, not to be confused with like white supremacy, that's a different type of Arianism, um, uh, even spelled differently, but they took up the person of Jesus Christ. There was a bishop, I believe, in the second or third century named Arius, who taught that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the Logos, Son of God, was not co-eternal with the Father. He was a, it's very much what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. He's an exalted being. He was the first thing that God the Father created, but he's not of the same substance, and he's not co-eternal. So that was one of the main points of controversy at the Council of Nicaea. It had nothing to do uh, with the issue of canonization. Okay? What about the Apocrypha? The Apocrypha is a collection of books written between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is why the Catholic Bible has 73 books versus 66. So they have seven more. Um, the books are called Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes, different book. Um, wisdom or Wisdom of Solomon, First and Second Maccabees, sounds like a restaurant, I guess it's Applebee's, uh, Tobit, Baruch, and Judith. And so they're written during that window between Malachi and Matthew in our Bibles, right? That 400 year silent period. Um, are they false? Well, I think probably most of what they say is true, but they're not canon. They're not the canon of scripture. Those are two completely different issues. Something doesn't have to be completely fabricated. It could be very factual and a lot and, and not be right, not be scripture. And that's kind of where, by my estimation, these apocryphal books would come in. Um, the apocrypha contained what is contained within the Septuagint. What is the Septuagint? That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Um, it was translated between the 3rd and 1st centuries B.C. The rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, never considered any of these books to be scripture. That's very powerful. They did not consider this to be on par with the law and the prophets. Okay? They never considered them to be the same thing. Um, following the rabbinic tradition and also the tradition of a four, early 5th century theologian, an historian named Jerome, Catholics call him Saint Jerome. We're all saints, yes. <laughs> so I'm Saint Rich. You know? Like, okay, no kidding about that. The Bible says. 
Um, but the, re the, the reformers in the 16th century excluded the Apocrypha from the canon of Scripture. So you see their reasoning for that. We're not going to include these books. The rabbis didn't, right? You go all the way back to St. Jerome, and he didn't, and he gives all of his reasons for that. So there's no reason for us to include them. Okay. Uh, interestingly, and this is a good point, the Catholics and the Protestants agree 100% on the books that are included in both. In other words, there's not a book that's in the, quote, Protestant Bible that's not also in the Catholic Bible, right? They don't leave out one that we include. Um, we're in complete agreement on the 27 books of the New Testament. No more, no fewer, okay? Same 27 books of the New Testament. Um, and both Catholics and Protestants reject the so-called Gnostic Gospels. The one everybody knows about is what? The Gospel of... Thomas. Oh, I'm going to say that. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you Thomas, right? That's the one that gets thrown in my face the most. The Gospel of Thomas. So what are these Gnostic Gospels? The word gnosis, right, that Gnostic comes from, refers to knowledge of spiritual mysteries. These special revelations from God that only some people get. Again, I'm not going to say a lot. I'm not going to open a can of worms. Got to be real careful with this stuff, folks. Got to be real careful. Um, do not trust every spirit. Test the spirits, right? Uh, special knowledge, knowledge of spiritual mysteries. One common Gnostic belief was called docetism. Okay, Docetism, which denied Jesus' humanity. So if you're familiar with 1 John, you can see directly where he's writing to challenge the Docetists. You know, any spirit that denies Jesus came in the flesh is not from God, right? Why is he, why is he writing that? Because these heresies were already there. Jesus was a spiritual being. He was some type of avatar of God or the Son of God. But he didn't really have a physical body like you and I have. Well, if you deny that, then again, you deny the atonement, right? And you deny a whole lot of scripture, okay? Inevitably, uh, as the gospel went into Greece, what do you see? You see synchronization. You see a combination of biblical Christianity, but also a merging of the beliefs of the Greeks and their philosophies and their spirituality. Um, the earliest of the Gnostic Gospels is the Gospel of Thomas. I'd say nine times out of ten, if someone brings up the Gnostic Gospels on the street, and if you ask them for an example of one, they're probably going to say the Gospel of Thomas. Um, it was the earliest one, and it was written around 150 A.D., okay? Jesus died, depending on who you trust, either 33 A.D. or 35 A.D., so... Thomas probably would have been like, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 years old at the time. What's the problem with the Gospel of Thomas not showing up until at least 150 AD? One thing we know right away is that, what? Thomas did not write the Gospel of Thomas, right? Somebody else did. And then somebody else is like, hey, I think I'll use one of the word, one of the names of the apostles so people will read this junk that I wrote out that said it. A woman wants to become a Christian, she needs to become a man. So there you have transgenderism in the Gospel of Thomas, different topic, okay, we'll get there in a few weeks. Um, it's not part of the canon. There's no good reason to think that, okay? That's literally what it says, it's the closing line. If a woman wants to become a follower of Christ, supposedly Jesus said she must first become a man, okay? Like, wow, that doesn't sound very Christian, and it's not. Uh, so it just gives you an idea that this is not something that uh, was ever there as part of the original Bible. It's some crazy idea that you get from synchronizing Christianity and uh, Greek philosophy many, many years later. Okay? Um, rather than being a challenge to the canon of Scripture, the rise of the Gnostic Gospels and Gnostic heresy were a major reason for the canon of Scripture. Okay? It's one of the reasons why they said, okay, we got to write this stuff down, guys. we got to have a definitive list. Yeah, Paul's epistle to the Galatians and his epistle to the Ephesians and 1 Peter, or whatever they called it, the letter of Peter, are being circulated and copied among the churches. And the churches are reading them, they're learning from them, people are growing in Christ. 
So we're saying we need a definitive list because we need a way to say these are the authorized, these are the inspired teachings, these are the apostolic teachings, and these over here are not. You see that? Because it's real easy to get it the other way around, which causes a ton of confusion. So rather than being, I think it's on the next slide, I know I'm talking fast, I'm just trying to get through so much here. Um, well, it's the one after this. Well, I'll go back. <laughs> Canonization did not create scripture. That's the wrong way to think of it. So like, voila, the Catholic Church, fourth century, oh, these are the books of scripture. You know, what, what happened is they got together and recognized officially the books that had been considered apostolic and authoritative in the word of God all along. I'll give you one example that's not in your notes. There was an early church uh, father named Clement of Rome. And he also wrote to the Corinthian church. You have 1st Clement, then you have 2nd Clement. These obviously aren't part of scripture. But they were letters he wrote, and he sent to the Corinthian church. And one of the things Clement of Rome wrote to the Corinthian church in 95 AD, still in the 1st century, he quotes Paul, and he's, he quote, quotes from one of Paul's epistles, and he says, Thus saith the Holy Spirit. You see how powerful that is? He's quoting one of Paul's letters, and he, said, he didn't say, thus saith Paul. He said, thus saith the Holy Spirit. So he recognized this had full apostolic authority, and as such, it should be regarded not just as an opinion of a man, but as Holy Scripture. Okay? So the canonization process did not create Scripture. Rather, it formally recognized what had been regarded as Holy Scripture all along. Go back one slide. Um, so the Criteria for canonization, I put those on your notes. The font's kind of small. These books were not chosen willy-nilly. They were not cherry-picked. It wasn't like they took a vote and said, oh, we have uh, 172 bishops say yay, and 193 say nay, so no, that one's out. You know, that's not at all. That's the image that people want you to have. If they, <laughs> they're trying to get you to doubt the Bible, that's not how it actually happened. Probably should move this thing. I want to knock it over. Um, okay, so some criteria: either an apostle or a first-hand assistant of an apostle, someone like Mark, right? Traveling companion of Peter. He went around as Peter preached and taught, and he learned. He heard the same sermons, the same stories about the life of Jesus and Jesus' ministry from Peter day in and day out, right? So either an apostle or a first-hand assistant of an apostle wrote the book. By the way, it's not true, we don't have time to get into this, absolutely not true that we don't have any idea who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We absolutely do know that's preposterous. It's one of those dumb things that skeptics want you to believe that is actually not factual. It was so well established, they didn't have to put their names on it, okay? And that was not customary for them to put their names on there anyway, unless it's personal correspondence. If it's a biography, you just write it out. Everybody knew Matthew wrote this. Everybody knew John wrote this, okay? So we absolutely do know who wrote uh, the Gospels. They're not anonymous. That's false. Um, okay, so in order to be from an apostle, it has to be old enough to be apostolic. It has to be within the first century. If it doesn't show up until the second century, it's out, okay? It's got to be consistent with other apostolic teaching, so in, internally consistent, we would say it has to have integrity uh, vis-a-vis the corpus of what was being taught by the apostles. It had to have gained wide acceptance by the churches of the day, not just locally, but across the vast area. And often it was accompanied by miracles um, when it was received and a powerful ability to transform people's personal lives, okay? A very powerful witness to the Holy Spirit um, empowering this particular work. So it was not willy-nilly the work criteria. In fact, the word canon uh, would have been essentially their word for measuring stick, like yardstick or meter stick. That would have been a canon, okay? Something has to meet these specifications in order to pass the test. All right, we already did that one. Okay. But it was written by fallible men. 
If you get that one, just ask the person. And it's an honest question. Don't say it's smart alecky. I probably do that sometimes and shouldn't, but uh, I'm working on that. It's like, well, do, do you like, do you believe anything that you read? What about your physics textbook? You know, what about your American history textbook? I guess you probably shouldn't believe that. What about <laughs> uh, whatever class you're taking? Well, you, you can't believe any of it. Just tell me, put that on your test and see how your professor likes it. Sorry, professor. Um, I don't believe any of this stuff because it was written by people and we all know people make mistakes. You're going to flunk the test. Obviously, people do not hold to this standard consistently. Okay? Yes, people are fallible. But guess what? You can go to a doctor and get a stick put in your heart and they're probably going to get it right. It's not a, a shot in the dark when they do brain surgery on you or the pharmacist gives you certain medications. We can be very, very, very highly convinced that people are going to get it right. When you drive across a bridge, you're trusting that the engineers got it right. The people who built it did it right. When you get on an airplane, you don't go and shake the hand of the pilot, right? <laughs> and, and ask them, quiz them on their flight training. How many hours, where have you flown? And has anybody ever done that? Probably not, but you've flown on airplanes. So we can be very certain that something is good and it's going to work out okay even if we don't check all of the facts. So that's a sham criticism. It was written by fallible men. So what? God can use a crooked stick to draw a straight line. Okay? He doesn't need perfect people. But a big part of the miracle is he uses highly flawed people to do what he wants to do. Right? And this is not just true here. This is true, like, for all of Christianity. Praise God. Right? God can use a crooked stick to draw a straight line. This is not a valid criticism of the Bible. Okay, the Bible is preserved. Oh my gosh, this is good. <laughs> How fast will my tongue go? Um, how has the Bible text been authenticated? Uh, we're only going to talk about the last one. If you have questions about history or historic, historicity, like archaeology, um, shoot me an email or something. Uh, we'll talk about biblical textual criticism. What does that mean? It doesn't mean being critical of the Bible. Biblical criticism, textual criticism, is a good thing. Okay? It actually confirms the believability of the Bible. If you go to seminary, you'll take a class in textual criticism. Textual criticism means thinking critically about manuscripts. I'm just going to abbreviate that MS. And variations in manuscripts, yes, those exist. Are they a problem? No. I'm going to tell you why to identify the original reading of the Bible. Okay, so you guys know what a manuscript is. They wrote stuff out on parchments or papyrus and stuff like that, skins of animals, and they copied them literally handwritten. That's what manuscript means, right? Written by hand. They didn't have a printing press back then. Our oldest manuscript fragment goes to about 125 AD. We do not have any of the originals. Is that a problem? No, I'm gonna tell you why. Okay. The oldest known fragment is called the Rylands Fragment, and it dates to about 125 AD. I've seen a few scholars dating this even to the end of the third, first century. It's a small fragment of a part of John 18. It's written on both sides. Okay. Obviously, this one's tiny. As time goes on, you start getting pages, you start getting entire scrolls, and uh, so some questions here. Of the New Testament, how many manuscripts do we have? How close in time are they to the original writing? And how do they compare to one another? Okay, so the answers we're looking for to be very convincing to number one is we have a bunch of them. If you only have two, that's kind of problematic. How close in time to the original? The closer, the better. Okay, and then how do they compare to one another? We're going to take a look at that. Uh, so some manuscript evidence for the ancient writings. We don't have time to do all of the comparisons. Uh, the New Testament was written between AD 40, probably the first book of the New Testament written was not Matthew. It was probably James. James was probably written about 43 AD, about 10 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Is that news to you guys? <laughs> James was written very, very early, okay? Many of Paul's epistles were written prior to the Gospels being written. So this information was already being circulated. One of the criticisms people like to give is like, well, 
we're going to talk about the end of Mark. Maybe those last few verses weren't in there. Okay. Oh, and the skeptic will say, well, that's a big problem because that was the first record of the resurrection of Jesus. No, it wasn't. <laughs> first Corinthians 15 was. Where Paul says, I passed on to you that which you also received, right? Um, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He's buried and he was raised on the third day according to Scripture. That dates back to within two years, possibly six months, of the actual resurrection of Jesus. Okay? So no, Mark's not the earliest reference. Um, okay, so for the Bible, you have the earliest fragment, 125 years, gap, 25 to 50 years. Number of manuscripts, this says 24,000. It was written in 1979. That number is over 25,000 now. We're getting close to 26,000. We have 26,000 copies of the New Testament. That's a lot of copies, right? Well, let's look at, uh, by comparison, Homer, the Iliad, written 900 BC, earliest fragment or copy, 400 BC. That's a gap of 500 years five times or more what it is for the Bible. Number of manuscripts. With Homer, you have 643, which is amazing for a work of antiquity, but it pales in comparison to the 25 to 26,000 copies of the New Testament that we have. Look at some of these other works like Plato. Um, 12,000 year gap between the time of writing and the earliest copy. Or sorry, 12,000. 1,200 years. 1,200 years. Number of manuscripts, seven. Do you think the philosophy department is having big debates about whether Plato really wrote this or not? Right? No, it's Plato wrote this, for sure, or at least we're reasonably confident, based upon seven manuscripts, the earliest copies dating to 1,200 years after the actual writing. But all of a sudden, when it comes to the Bible, with 25,000 manuscripts, 25 to 50 years after, oh, we don't know about those. Maybe they're best fit. Maybe they didn't say that. Maybe it was changed. Maybe it was edited. Right? No, that's baloney. It's a complete and total double standard. All right, question of this. How, how do uh, manuscripts compare to one another? Are they all exactly the same? Important question. This guy here, Bart Ehrman, I like to call him Bart Ehrman, uh, at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, probably one of the Biggest voices out there is a Bible critic today, although he does a good job defending the historical Jesus, because he will argue very vehemently that Jesus was a real person and really died on the cross. Um, but here's what he says. It is one thing to say that the originals were inspired, but the reality is that we don't have the originals, so saying that they were inspired doesn't help me much unless I can reconstruct the originals. Not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies of the originals. That's probably almost certainly not true. We cert almost certainly do have some of those. We don't even have copies of copies of the originals or copies of copies of copies of the originals. What we have are copies made later, much later. In many instances, they are copies made many centuries later. That's true. They were still making copies many centuries later, but that doesn't bring into question what is reported in those. Um, and these copies all differ from one another in many thousands of places. That's also true, and I'm going to tell you why that's not a problem. Because Urban wants people to read that and be like, oh wow, you can't trust the Bible. But in other places, I've heard him do this in debates when he's asked the question, do you think the New Testament has been reliably transmitted over time? He doesn't believe it, he's an agnostic. But he'll say, yeah, I do believe that. Well then why do you make statements like this, <laughs> right? You say all of that, but then you turn right around and say that you can trust it, it's reliable, you can believe what it says, it was preserved over time. It's like, well, why? Why do you, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Okay. So how many differences, they're also called variants, are there among the New Testament manuscripts? 138,607 words, Greek words, in the New Testament, the number of variants among the New Testament manuscripts is roughly 400,000. Sounds like Ehrman's right, doesn't it? If you just look at that, 400,000 variants, places in which there are differences among the manuscripts, and there's only 138,000 words. That sounds like a huge problem until you consider, remember we're talking about 25,000, 26,000 manuscripts, and that's, hold on, okay. <laughs> 
literally 99% of these variants have zero bearing on the meaning of the text. For example, you'll see spelling variants. I'm giving you English equivalents here, where, since we're not going to bring up Greek words. But for example, if you see Savior, S-A-V-I-O-R, and then you see Savior, S-A-V-I-O-U-R, you understand it's an alternate spelling of the same word. Well, guess what? You find alternate spellings of the same word among these manuscript copies. Does that bother you? No, it shouldn't bother you because it's completely a non-issue. Um, alternate grammatic structuring. For example, Joseph's wife, one of them might say, and the other one says, the wife of Joseph. <laughs> oh, wow, you, can't, you completely can't trust this thing, right? <laughs> it's the same exact meaning. And in fact, um, the Greek does not demand either one of those. You can use either, okay? And they mean exactly the same thing. And there are some obvious misspellings or omissions. Kind of an English example using an old proverb, a stitch in time saves none, okay? If you see that, you're like, oh wow, somebody misspelled the word. They meant to put nine there and they wrote none instead because this is a phrase that everybody knows. It's been circulated. A bunch of other copies have nine. This one has none. Well, all of a sudden, if the one that has none is one of a thousand manuscripts of that text, then all of a sudden we've just introduced 999 variants into that number. Does it mean anything? No, it's not a problem in any way. So that's 99% of these variants. Here are examples of what scholars consider meaningful differences. So they would agree, Ehrman would agree, these are not meaningful, they don't mean anything. Well, what is debated among the scholars? Things like this. One manuscript will say Jesus, and in the same place, the other one will say the Lord Jesus. Okay, That's considered to be a meaningful difference. It's called an expansion of piety. Can you kind of imagine how that got into the mix, that type of thing? Because of reverence for Jesus, right? People are like, well, it does say, I, I see right here, I'm a scribe, I'm writing it out. It says Jesus, but I want to be super respectful since he's my Lord, so I'm going to put the Lord Jesus. Does it change the meaning of the passage in any way? Absolutely not. Okay, here's another example. Jesus came, Mark 1, 14. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God versus Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. One has kingdom of God, the other just says the gospel of God. Are, are you going to suddenly believe that these are two completely different messages that Jesus was preaching? No, the meaning is not changed in any way, shape, or form. And again, people like Bart Ehrman know this, but they pretend like they don't know it. And Jesus went into the temple of God. Matthew 21, 12, verses, and Jesus went into the temple. Well, what other temple was there in Jerusalem? Right? It was the temple of God. It has no bearing. Yes, it is a variant. And if you just start adding up numbers, and you don't tell people that this is all they're talking about, it seems like a huge problem. Is it actually a problem? No, it's not a problem. Okay? So this clears up just about every problem with variants. We don't have time to get into the three exceptions. So email me if you want to talk more about the big three, 1 John 5, 7. Um, the long ending to Mark, which is why you'll see a footnote in your study Bible at the end of Mark's Gospel, and also at the beginning of John 8, the story of the woman caught in adultery, which was probably almost certainly not in the original version of the Gospel of John, but it probably was a true event from the life and ministry of Jesus. So again, if you want to know more about that, Email me. We don't have time right now. Okay. Um, okay. Implications of the variants. They actually affirm the New Testament rather than undermine it. They affirm it. Why? Because we can make judgment calls because we now know better than ever what the New Testament says. The King James Version was translated from 16, was it? Was it 16 manuscripts? 16. Um, uh, uh, 16. Under 100, yeah. fair to say. So, okay, maybe a few dozen manuscripts. Today, whenever they're 
modernizing a translation of the Bible, they used computer software to pull across 25, 26,000 copies of the New Testament. And it says the same thing that the King James says. It's not like you read one version that says Jesus rose from the dead. This one says he didn't. One of them says he rose after three days. The other one says after three months. You don't find anything like that. One says that he walked on water. water. The other says he swam in the water. It doesn't, it doesn't say that. There are no differences in anything having to do with the teaching, the doctrine, the beliefs, anywhere. Okay? So they actually affirm the New Testament. The exceptions prove the rule. The list of doctrines that depend on... Okay, so on this next page... Um, I'm going to give you a comprehensive and definitive list of church doctrines that depend on any contested passage. Those three that we skipped over, here are, is the comprehensive list of doctrines that depend upon those three passages of Scripture. Okay. There they are. Get a picture of it if you want. There's, there's all the doctrines that depend on those contested versions. You'll notice something about my list. It's not there. Okay, so it has nothing to do with orthodox, historical, Christian teaching, Christian practice, what the apostles were saying, what the churches believed, nothing. It's a non-issue. People like Bart Ehrman and skeptics like to really loudly trumpet this stuff, but at the end of the day, when you actually study it, you realize not only is it not a problem, and actually the more you study it, if you're a believer, will cause you to believe more. I'm more confident now than I was before I studied all this stuff, because I know actually how they do what they do, okay? And if an error creeps in, we can tell you now, where exactly? Was that the 8th century that that variant came in? Was it the 11th century? We can tell you now. We can see the before, we can see it come in, we can see it follow this line, and we can tell you today that that was not the original. We have more reason to believe the Bible now, here in 2022, than we ever had before. Most people on the street believe the exact opposite of that. Why is that the case? Because they're misinformed and they don't care to actually take the time to study it. Okay? All right. So the Bible is peculiar, it's unique, it's prophetic, it's predetermined, it's preserved, and the Bible was proclaimed by Christ. I don't have a lot on this, just a few things. Again, you could talk, you could do a whole sermon on this. Jesus... When facing temptation, what did he say in response to the devil three consecutive times? It is written. It is written. Do that more as a Christian. <laughs> it is written. Here's what the scripture says. This tells us something about Jesus' view of scripture. He didn't say, I feel or I think. He says, thus saith the Lord, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every uh, word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but what? My word will never pass away. Matthew 22, 29, Jesus says, You do err, knowing not the blank or the power of God. Yeah, you're in error. You, you, don't, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Well, you're up the creek without a paddle there. Okay? John 10, 35, Jesus says, Scripture cannot be broken. And there's a bunch more. I just, for time's sake, there's four, okay? Jesus' view of the Scripture should be your view of the Scripture. He quoted it, thus saith the Lord, it is written. He didn't question. He yielded it, he, sorry, wielded it past the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, which it is, okay? And so should you. Y'all have seen the bumper sticker, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Some people say, well, God said it, that should be enough. I agree with that. But here's what I would say. Um, I, put it on your, I put it on your sheet. God said it, Jesus believed it, and he preached it, and he proclaimed it, and he prophesied his death, and he rose again just like he said he would. I, I think even if you had some questions, that kind of settles it, right? I'm going to go with the guy who rose from the dead. And he says it's the Word of God, so I'm going to say yes, it's the Word of God. All right, finally, the Bible is powerful, life-changing. If I had time, I would ask for a testimony. We don't. Obviously, it changed my life. <laughs> I, I gave you guys my story. I was the faculty advisor for UGA Atheists for two years, 2009, 2010. A lot of stuff happened. What was it ultimately 
that brought me from death to life. Faith comes through hearing the word of Christ. Okay, that's Romans 10, 17. It's on the slide. It's also on your page. Specifically for me, it was reading the Gospel of John. Okay, you read that. It's fine to use apologetics. That's what this class is about. You should. It's a tool. But it should never take second place to the written word of God. Okay, the Holy Spirit, believe it or not, is much more powerful in making arguments to people and convincing them in their hearts than you and I are. Or then name your apologist there, Frank Turiak or, or whoever. Okay, brilliant people, um, but faith comes through hearing the word of God, not through listening to William Lane Craig, Reasonable Faith Podcast. In fact, many things I would say don't listen to him, okay? Um, faith comes through hearing the word of Christ, through the word of God. That's God's plan. Why? Because it's the word of God. And nothing can bring about that spark in your innermost person, in your heart, like the word of God can. Okay? Um, your testimony, very powerful. So we'll read Revelation 12 here. I heard a loud voice of heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God, and they, that's us, that's of us who are in Christ, okay, conquered him, we defeated him, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even to death. They loved the word of God. They knew the word, they hid the word of God in their heart. They treasured the word of God. And even went on trial for their lives, even when faced with their head being chopped off and crucified upside down and flogged and flayed, stung to death. They didn't back down because they were certain of the word of God, the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. Okay. All right. Q and A, we've got a few minutes. That could have been the whole five weeks there. In a way, I wish it was. <laughs> because then I could have talked a lot slower. But uh, there was a lot to put in there. Is this information helpful? Is it kind of like coming in at the right level? Because I don't want to be way up here or way down there. The idea is something that's useful to you. Okay? You did a great job. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering if you even took a second breath. Yeah. <laughs> I'll breathe when I get home. <laughs> I didn't work out today, so I'll have extra time to breathe later. Yes, sir. Rich, can you share that PowerPoint that you just went through with us? I mean, is that yeah. something you can share? That way we could go back through it and use it, you know? We'd like yeah. That. yeah, just email me, um, rsuplita, R-S-U-P-L-I-T-A, at gmail.com. Okay. And it's it's a right check. It's definitely the right size to send. It's only it's only eight names, I think. I have a friend who is a believer, and um, she's a little bit disillusioned right now by what she's seeing in the world. Um, essentially, the elite controlling much of what we hear, see in the news, what products come to us, that type of thing. And so she's also now doubting the canon. And I know she's ordered the Book of Enoch. I'm not sure what else. And I just, I don't know how to talk with her about that. What would you recommend? Essentially, I think she believes, well, they've lied to us about so much why not this along the way? Well, I would want to draw a distinction, obviously, between like contemporary media outlets on either the left or the right, okay? I would want to, that's kind of irrelevant. Obviously, these are companies, and what they're most concerned about is numbers. So I'd want to draw a distinction between the, sort of like the contemporary media um, as a profit-making endeavor versus the history of the Bible, which you know goes back to the before Christ times with the, the Tanakh, with the Hebrew Old Testament, and also the church has a very, very rich tradition now for 
coming up on 2,000 years of preserving the Bible, a chain of command that goes all the way back to the first century, right? The, the idea of the game of telephone. I don't know if she's hit you with that one yet. The comedian made a clip about that. You'll hear that. It's like a game. If you guys have played the game of telephone, like if I whisper something in Wayne's ear and he whispers into Adam's ear and it goes all the way around the room, um, what I told Wayne was I'm going to have KFC tomorrow for lunch and I'm going to get extra mashed potatoes with extra gravy. And <laughs> right? by the time it gets all the way around the room, it's like my uncle has a kangaroo um, and has three eyes and hops backwards. <laughs> oh, that's just like the Bible. Well, no. You know, here's what it would be like. And he's saying a statement about KFC here over the microphone. Then I hand the microphone to Wayne, and he repeats it back to me, and y'all hear it. And he passes it to Adam, and Adam repeats it, and we all hear it. What are the chances then that this message that makes it all the way around the room is going to be intact? It's like virtually 100%, right? Because if there's an error that creeps in, we're going to see again exactly where it crept in, who it crept in with, why. How it was fixed. They'll say, no, that's not it. Fix it. Change it back to this. And it's going to be preserved, right? So, so I don't know. I would ask, ask her about that. But also, just kind of like, just ask her, what? So what are, is, is there anything besides the meaning? Like, is there something in the Bible itself that you find particularly problematic? I got the point. Yeah. I, I think maybe she thinks there was corruption in the church along the way. I, I'm not sure. I, I think yes. it's just a, a general <laughs> distrust. But, well, yeah, again, that's that's true, right? We know for sure there's corruption in the church. There has been historically. There is today. I guess one of the big, what was one of the big things Jesus confronted during his ministry was corruption in the church, really more than anything else. The prophets of the Old Testament were constantly confronting corruption in the church, abuses of power, uh, misinformation on down the line. I would say those issues haven't changed, but those issues should not determine um, whether or not we, we believe and trust the Bible, those, those are two completely different issues. Yeah, any, any line of um, work, there, there are corrupt surgeons. That doesn't mean you don't get surgery, right? There are corrupt police officers. That doesn't mean there's not good police officers. There are corrupt lawyers. There's corrupt accountants. There's corrupt pastors. There's corruption in, in just about every, well, I'd say every human endeavor. That doesn't mean that it doesn't follow <laughs> that we can't trust anybody in any of those professions then. And I'd say even how much more uh, is, is that true about the Word of God? Clint? Right. You know, um, you know the, the thing about the Bible is this is something I've been, I've been just thought of actually about while you were talking here. So I remember learning in history about the Protestant Reformation, and then uh, before the Protestant Reformation, now after the Bible had the, the manuscript between that time and uh, the Protestant Reformation. So the Bible just said Hebrew and, and Latin and Greek, right? Originally in Hebrew Old Testament, right? Um, Greek New Testament, the Latin was primarily the Vulgate. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Is what? Um, yeah, that's where you get. That's where that came into the picture. The okay. Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. The Vulgate was the Latin translation. So that was so it was the Vulgate, and then that's obviously that was the Protestant Reformation, and then after that there was the Protestant Reformation. I, okay, I was just thinking about the, the King James Bible. Because I know that was. 1611. Yeah, 1611. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That came from, um, I think it was Tyndale, wasn't it, that originally made the translations? And... Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, 1611 is when it was commissioned. And it was obviously the modern English translation of the day. Mm -hmm. people, people spoke King's English, right? Which is why it so, can be so clunky for us, because we don't say the and thou and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what's for next week and then we gotta right. go? Right. <laughs> okay, so there is a God, atheism is false, one, two, the Bible is the word of God, and three, Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Really, in a way, next week is the most important. They're all important. They're all intertwined. That Jesus Christ is the only way back to God. There are not many paths or one path. 
Christianity is the true religion, if you can use that word. The other religions all miss the mark. Uh, there's salvation in no other name. We'll talk specifically about what Jesus did, uh, his perfect life, his sacrificial death, and very specifically about the resurrection, not as a sermon, although it would make a great sermon, um, but evidences for the physical resurrection of Jesus, his bodily resurrection from the dead. Uh, it's been referred to as the linchpin of Christianity. If the re Paul admits as much. He says, if Christ be not raised from the dead, if that did not happen, then take next week off, don't come back to church, you know, sleep in on Sundays, go to brunch, um, because Christianity is false. But if Christ is risen from the dead, then I'm going to agree with C.S. Lewis. Christianity, if true, is of infinite importance. And the evidence is that Christ did rise from the dead. You can make a very, very, very compelling legal historical case, okay? Not even using the Bible. I will have Bible in there. But you can just look at historical evidences and make a very resoundingly powerful case that Jesus conquered the grave, that he rose from the dead. And so that's what we're going to be looking at next week. And then the week after that, um, the sexual revolution, specifically the LGBTQ revolution. And the week after that, sanctity of life, with a particular focus on abortion. All right, let me pray for us real quick. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for these folks. Uh, thank you for being our teacher here tonight. And help us to retain and be prepared, God, to, um, to give an answer for what we believe and why. Um, you've given us your word. We don't need to back down. We need to reach out with love. We need to uh, reach out uh, humbly and gracefully. But we do need to stand firm in the truth. This is not a time to retreat. It's not a time to shy away or back away. It's not a time to uh, just want to be friends with everybody no matter what the cost is. It's time for the church to stand up. We thank you that this church is a church that stands, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would reinforce us in your word through the power of your spirit that we may stand in that day. In Jesus' name, amen.